This is the Heartland Daily Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. This is Anne Marie Schieber from Healthcare News. Few people want to spend their final years in a nursing home when they get older, but for many families, that is the only choice. And one reason is because long-term care is very expensive, especially after age 85. And to manage this cost, many families get Medicaid to pay for it. But this has created a number of multiple market distortions and has compromised care. My guest today, Stephen Moses, has studied long-term health care for decades, and he has a new paper out that he co-published with the Paragon Health Institute. Welcome. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you. Yeah, it's good to have you back on the podcast. We've talked to you before about this issue. Um, this paper is terrific, and we'll include a link uh, in the podcast notes. But first, I want to back up, and maybe you could tell our listeners about the ease in getting Medicaid to pay for long-term care. This is not even a secret. You hear it advertised on the radio of people telling families how they can do this. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it's uh, not commonly understood. The conventional wisdom is that you have to become impoverished before the government helps you with long-term care. But the truth is very different. Uh, I call it the fallacy of impoverishment. In fact, income is rarely an obstacle to qualifying for Medicaid for long-term care because most states subtract your private health and long-term care costs from your income before determining whether you're low income. So you can be very high income if you have high health and long-term care costs. Other states that don't do that uh, allow you to divert money into what's called Miller Income Diversion Trust, and then you qualify. So you're artificially low income, not genuinely low income. Assets, likewise, are rarely a problem because most assets that people, older people own, are exempt from Medicaid eligibility criteria. Uh, For example, you can have home equity up to $955,000 in some states, a minimum of $636,000. And with no dollar limit, you can have one vehicle, home furnishings, uh, personal belongings, including heirlooms, whether you bought them last week or uh, 100 years ago. Uh, Prepaid burial plans don't count. Term life insurance. You can have one business, including the capital and cash flow of unlimited value. And Individual retirement accounts don't count against you as long as they're in payout status, which most are because uh, of the required minimum uh, withdrawal requirements Mm -hmm. at age 62. So uh, really, long-term care for Medicaid is readily available not only to the poor, but to the middle class and even to the affluent who seek those uh, Medicaid planners you mentioned uh, who help uh, really affluent people self-impoverish artificially to qualify for Medicaid. And yeah, I'm sure this this is uh, welcome news to families who inherit a lot of these assets. And you and I have talked about that because states are supposed to go after that to pay back some of these bills, but they're not very good. Um, I, I want to, that's probably, um, we, we can talk about that a little bit later on. But I mean, this whole system, since so many people are getting Medicaid to pay for long-term care, has that compromised the quality of long-term care over the decades? Oh, it has in many ways. Uh, Medicaid for many years paid exclusively for nursing homes, and it still predominantly pays for nursing homes as opposed to the kind of care people want, home care or assisted living. Uh, It paid too little to ensure quality care. Medicaid often reimburses nursing homes less than the cost of providing the care. It caused caregiver shortages by 
paying too little. In other words, people don't want to take those uh, highly stressful, uh, dangerous jobs caring for people who can't care for themselves uh, at uh, wages that are at or below the uh, minimum wage. Now, Medicaid impeded by assisted living and home care development, alternative care settings that people prefer, by making nursing home care free or vastly subsidized. It also had the effect of crowding out private insurance for mm. long-term care. Yeah. Why private insurance if you can get the government to pay? And it nearly eliminated private pay at market rates for nursing homes, which created tremendous stress. Right now, nursing homes are really underwater, and uh, all the administration is doing is uh, offering them more money and more regulations, um, which... Yeah. Do not suffice. Well, you know, I suppose when we're young and healthy, we can't imagine that someone is going to need to take care of us in our older years. What are the facts for someone who makes it to age 65? Uh, will they be able to live independently as they age? Well, uh, some can, uh, some won't be able to. Uh, Long-term care isn't a big problem at age 65, but need and cost spike at around age 85. Uh, boomers now start turning 85 in 2031, and that's incidentally just right around the time Social Security and Medicare become insolvent, kind of mm. creating a perfect storm of social problems. The the over age 85 numbers nearly double between 2020 at 2.2 percent and 2040 when they'll be 3.9 percent, and that's going to put great pressure on all levels of care: nursing homes, assisted living, home care, whatever. All of them are going to be stressed even further than they are now. Now, people prefer home care. But it's proving to be very expensive, rising 10.5% uh, recently compared to 4.9% for general health care spending, despite hopes for rebalancing. We've been told all we have to do is spend less on nursing homes and more on home care, and it'll save money. But that has not proved to be the case. Already, paid caregivers are in short supply. Oh, yeah. And the Biden administration is clamping down with regulations and quality demands, but without the extra funding needed to support them. Yeah, I, I have some friends who are in this situation and how difficult it is for them to hire a regular help to come in because sometimes you need round the clock care and it's just today with the labor shortage it's just extremely difficult um what do you think um you know a lot of people do think that family members will be there to take care of them um or that they will have enough money saved in their retirement accounts uh to be able to hire help is this realistic well uh, as a matter of fact, friends and families, because of the dissatisfaction with government-provided care, uh, offer the equivalent of $522 billion worth of care. But they do that at enormous personal and financial stress, uh, including foregone earnings, reduced la leisure, and direct out-of-pocket care expenses. Now, interestingly, a third of people aging won't need long-term care at all, but 20% will need five years or more. That's the catastrophic risk. So saving for long-term care is kind of a fool's errand, uh, the way the incentives are built in now. You don't need the savings unless you have catastrophic costs. You're one of those one in five. It's a small probability. And if you do, Medicaid is available even for the best facilities due to what I call uh, key money. These advisors that artificially impoverish you 
tell you, don't worry about being stuck on Medicaid. Yeah, it's a welfare problem. Yes, uh, program, it has a terrible reputation. But as long as you have enough m- private money to pay privately for a little while, even a few months, we can get you into the nicest facilities. By the way, that excludes poor people who don't have key money. So the more affluent folks who gain Medicaid get into the nicest facilities while the poor people Medicaid is supposed to serve are crowded yeah. out. Now, you, and again, you're taking gamble. You're, you're taking a, a bet. You're making a bet on the future. It's very hard to do that. Um, you have a terrific chart in your paper that shows how long-term care financing breaks down. Can you talk about that? I, I just think it's very cool. There's just so much of it paid for, for by the government. Yes. Uh, you know, the chart shows that long-term care spending is now Uh, approaching half a trillion dollars. It's probably over that by now. Medicaid is only 42% of that, but its impact is much greater uh, than that percentage suggests. And that's due to cost shifting. Medicaid pays 70% of the private pay rate. So it gets uh, off easy. Um, In other words, it affects more people than the percentage implies. Mm -hmm. There's also the spend through of social security income and other income. People on Medicaid are required to apply their other income to offset Medicaid's cost of care. So sometimes Medicaid pays zero and people pay privately the entire amount out of their social security and other income, but the nursing home gets the Medicaid rate at below cost very often. And then Medicare's higher reimbursement for long-term care offsets Medicaid's meager reimbursement, but MACPAC is uh, the agency that uh, uh, monitors these things is always trying to cut Medicare. So Medicaid financing of long-term care is very vulnerable to the insecurity of Social Security and Medicare, which are both scheduled to become insolvent early in the 2030s. Mm. Now, Medicare is 18% of long-term care, and it pays very generously compared to Medicaid and covers short-term acute, subacute, and rehab care but not long-term care. So nursing homes try to maximize Medicare and limit Medicaid, which is what most of the long-term custodial care is paid for. Finally, private pay is down to only 13.5%, and half of that is really just Social Security and other income spent through of people who are already on Medicaid. Yeah, I... I know. And these families become very adept at trying to figure out, they work through social workers, you know, which program is going to pay more. I I noticed that the people that I know in this situation move their loved ones in and out of nursing homes, probably because Medicare probably picks up the tab for those short-term stays, as you mentioned. You know, are individuals and families just being irresponsible by not thinking about this until it's too late. I mean, some people have tried to purchase long-term care insurance policies, but they're really expensive. Nobody likes to do it. And again, um, people are, um, think they can sock this money away in investment accounts and hope that it's going to grow enough to, to take care of these expenses. Well, long-term care insurance is very expensive. Um, Fire insurance probably wouldn't be so cheap if every 10th house burned down. I mean, that's part of the problem. But LTC insurance is more expensive than it would have to be if it weren't for government policies. By making Medicaid long-term care easy to get uh, after the insurable event occurs, decades after you need to buy insurance against it, and by printing money and driving interest rates artificially low, Government distorted the market. Yeah. At Federal Reserve imposed interest rates near zero. The long-term care insurance carriers 
could not get the anticipated and needed return on their reserves. So they had to raise premiums, which was the responsible thing to do sure. in order to be able to pay their claims. Well, that alienated prospects and angered policyholders, really hurting the industry's uh, reputation. But they did the right thing, and they creatively designed new products, such as hybrids with annuities and life insurance that that pay a, a benefit whether people need long-term care or not. And I would just invite listeners to compare that responsible behavior with what government has done. That is nothing to show up, shore up Medicare and Social Security, leaving uh, people vulnerable there. The bottom line is private LTC insurance will pay when claims come due, but government entitlements may not. Well, that, that is so true for healthcare overall. The more government, you know, everyone loves the idea that government will pay for all healthcare, long term care, but there is a huge trade off. <laughs> There's wait times. There is reduced compromised care because, you know, at some point you have to rationalize that spending and it happens at the expense of patients. It's really too bad. Your next paper um, is going to talk about solutions. <laughs> I can't wait to read this, um, but maybe you can kind of give us a preview. I mean, if we didn't rely so much uh, on, on government to pay for long term care, would you and I even be sitting here talking about this as a crisis? Well, I don't think so. If it weren't for Medicaid, people would worry about long-term care. It is a high risk, a, a, a small risk of a catastrophic loss, the kind of thing that lends itself to insurance. They would save investors sure for the risk as they do for fire, life, or health insurance. If they ended up needing long-term care, they would pay for it out of pocket, and therefore they would command red carpet access to top quality care in the venue of their choice, which is usually home care. With private money flowing at market rates into the system, entrepreneurs would compete to provide the best possible care in the most desired venues of care instead of government paying less than cost primarily for nursing homes that people don't want. Yeah. America's long-term care dysfunctions are entirely self-induced by counterproductive government policies, yet the only solutions that politicians, policymakers, and analysts come up with involve more government money and regulation, the very factors that caused the problems in the first place. In my next paper, Long-Term Care, the Solution, will take a different approach. The fundamental problem is that people don't worry about long-term care until they need it, and then Medicaid provides, creating a moral hazard that discourages early and responsible planning. So the solution is to front load the risk and liability of LTC so that people must save, invest, or insure for it before it's too late. Now, for how to do that in a politically feasible way, you'll have to wait for the paper coming out next year after a new, hopefully more amenable Congress takes office. Yeah, well, let's hope so. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, for joining us today. Um, and I have to say, this paper is really interesting, not just for, uh, for policy geeks, but for someone who has family members, maybe in their 80s, it's terrific from a personal finance perspective. You learn so much about what is out there and what you're going to have to deal with. So we will definitely include a link in the podcast notes, which uh, I would encourage you to, to check out. Um, thank you so much, Stephen, for coming on. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and I would encourage listeners to contact me directly. I'm always eager to talk to people about these issues. Thanks all, again. All right. Stephen Moses is the president of the Center for Long-Term Care Reform, the author of the new report, Long-Term Care, The Problem, just out this month. And um, thank you again, listeners, for tuning in. We do appreciate your listening to these discussions on free market solutions to healthcare. I would encourage you to become a regular subscriber to the Heartland Daily Podcast if you're not already. Uh, we talk about solutions on a wide range of issues, not just healthcare. 
And it also helps if you can share our links and rate our podcast plat- uh, on your favorite platform, um, because the response does help us uh, get continued support for presenting this information. Thank you so much. And be, I will be back next time with another topic from Healthcare News. This is Anne-Marie Schieber.